Welcome to the System Simplified Podcast, where we feature top leaders who share stories on how to successfully systemize a business. Now, let's get started with the show. And today, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest, Jeremy Slate. And I'm so thrilled to have you on the podcast, Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy. Hey, Adi. I am so excited to be here. Um, I know you and I have gotten to do, do quite a bit of collaboration and things over the last year. So it's great to kind of, uh, you know, I guess, do the other flow now and be on your show. So thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. So I'm sure a lot of our listeners probably know you because you're so famous, but I still would like to introduce you. And so Jeremy is the founder of the Create Your Own Life podcast, which studies the highest performer in the world. I love that, Jeremy, because I was on your podcast. You made me feel so good when you gave me that line <laughs> in the intro. I feel like amazing. Why, now. thank you. Yeah. So, you know, Jeremy studied literature in Oxford University. And I'm going to ask you a question about that because I love Oxford. I mean, I didn't go to university there. I just went to visit. So do want to ask you about but that. Most people, when they see me, don't believe that, by the way, because they're like, what? You're like a meathead. How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> we can do another show about that, I'm sure. <laughs> And you specialize in using podcasting and new media to create celebrity. And you were ranked number one in iTunes New, right? Mm -hmm. Number 78 in the iTunes Top 100, which is amazing just to get to the top 100 with your podcast in, on iTunes. And you were named number one podcast to listen to by Inc. Magazine in 2019, as well as being named top influencer by Forbes. And you didn't write it here, but I read that article where they basically interviewed you because you, they were trying to figure out like how, like, what do you do? Because you're such an amazing interviewer, right? I mean, they ask you, what are the <laughs> successful actions to become a great interviewer? So that was, that was an awesome article, by the way. Oh, thank and, you. Yeah, you're welcome. And, you know, you, after you were so successful with podcasting, so you and your wife, Brielle, you started, you founded a command your brand to help entrepreneurs get their message out by appearing as guests on podcasts. So that's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing uh, biography or, you know, pretty amazing resume there. So today we're going to talk because this podcast is all about systems, right? So we're going to talk about public relations as a system. Basically, how do you systematize public relations? Meaning, what do you do so it works every single time? And what actions do you have to have in place? And I think we should actually start by talking about what is public relations, because I'm sure some yeah. of our listeners go, what? Yeah, I know marketing, I know sales, but what is public relations? So it's it's an interesting subject because a lot of people have like a total like misunderstanding on even what the definition of public relations are. Because when you look at like public, people see that they're like, oh, it's talking to the public, but actually like a public's a type of audience. So you can have different publics, like maybe your audience are industrial businesses or their founders or whatever it may be. So in this case, a public's actually an audience. And in this case, it's making your good works known to that audience, making yourself known to that audience. So that way you're able to create trust, you're able to make a lot of your marketing and things like that work better. But in actuality, that's what public relations is, is finding out who is your audience, how do you communicate to them about what you're doing so that they know, like, and trust you so that everything else you do is more effective? That's right. And public relations should come before the marketing and the sales, right? Because yes. that's basically how you build it. So give us some examples of actions that a business owner can do as part mm -hmm. of public relations. Well, there, there's different types of campaigns you do. Like there could be like a media campaign where you're getting on TV and radio and things like that to talk about different things you're doing. Or there could be like a good works campaign. You know, we do like programs where we're going into schools and talking about uh, anti-drug uh, teaching and stuff like that. So there, there's different types of campaigns you can do depending on what kind of an audience you're trying to connect with, create trust with, or get known by. So it, it could be really creative depending on the industry. Um, I know for myself, one of the things that I like to talk to a lot of business owners about because they totally don't think of it is something I call a small pond PR strategy. Um, you know, everybody's a big fish in a small pond somewhere. So I teach them to actually how to get local media and get some of those press pieces out right away so that you can start to create some trust that way. But a lot of people like to kind of skip where people already know them, which to me is crazy, and try and get bigger things, which are going to be much harder for you to obtain, like the Forbes and the Inc. and the stuff like that. 
if you don't have a base and you haven't connected with people that already know you and things like that. So there's different types of campaigns you can run. You just have to find out what's more effective for you. And then within that, there might be like a different strategy behind a campaign, right? Like there may be a launch campaign where you're trying to get something out and get it seen, get it known in that way. There may be um, a crisis PR campaign, something not so good happened. You have to get ahead of it and you have to kind of fill that void with information to handle what may be out there. Um, there may be a, a trust campaign or, or I'm sorry, an awareness campaign where you really just want people to know about you. Like you're not well known enough. So you just want to get known. So it, you have to really find out what type of campaign you're running so that you can be most successful about it um, in the area you're going to run it. Right. So all of those, when I was thinking, because, you know, I'm thinking about systems and processes. So everything that you mentioned there, it's actually, you can have a business can have a process that is ready and mm -hmm. obviously do it. So for instance, like a, a risk management or a crisis management PR campaign. So you know what are the actions you need to do in case that happens, right? Yeah. Well, and that's something to think about too, Adi, because a lot of people, like they wait till something bad happens and then they do it. Like we had a client come to us one time and he's like, so I'm on ripoff report now and it's my first Google campaign and I'm not really a bad guy, but I had a client that it just didn't go so well with. And by the time that's happened, it's much, much, much harder to kind of outcreate something like that. Whereas if you're systematically continually going out there and getting the right media and creating trust and, you know, getting customer reviews and things like that, it hurts a little bit less when something like that happens. Because if you're getting big and you're growing, it's going to happen at some point in time. So you just need to be ready for it. So, but waiting until something happens, that's a problem. Absolutely. And I love your first advice in terms of really utilizing your communi existing communication lines, the people that yes. know you, because then they can spread it this can spread the news even more. So in terms of like, even when you record a podcast and you send it to your network, then they can send it to theirs, et cetera. And it just moves, you just get more exposure that way, as opposed to going into some kind of an area that nobody knows you and right. nobody's going to forward it. Right. So that's actually an excellent advice. I didn't, that definitely, I would be using it too. So that, thank you for that. Well, and that's something that could be systemized as well, because there's, there's, um, the easy way to do that for your local media, I tell people to start with a spreadsheet, list out all the small local publications you can think of. Like I grew up in a small town, five eighths of a mile in size, nothing happens there. So there's a weekly newspaper that goes to everybody's house in the mail in the county every week. And since there's no news, if you write a press release and send it in, they're going to print it. So you really should be, you know, systemizing writing press releases around all the different things you're doing in your business because a press release is something you use to get other media coverage but it in itself can be a media piece right because you're, you're writing it yourself and getting it out there and the people listening there is a really great article and it gets it gets updated annually but just google you know maybe you're, maybe you're listening to this in 2021 or maybe it's like 2025 and you're listening to this episode but Google HubSpot and how to write a press release in 2021. And you'll get some really great tips on how to do that. But then you should be really sending that into your local media sources. Um, when you're doing that, a lot of times you're looking for news tips. You're looking for newsroom. You're not usually looking for editor because that's more of a commentary thing. But that's the type of stuff you're looking for. And you could be running a campaign like that every time something interesting happens in your business. For sure. So you think that newspapers are still, it's still a going thing. You, you should actually try to do it on a real newspaper. You know why? Because nobody else is doing it. <laughs> they, they gave up. So there's less competition. And a lot of newspapers, like especially your local ones, surprisingly, still run in Google News and things like that. So you're going to get an online version anyway. A lot of my early press pieces on my website were things that were in Google News because they were in a local newspaper. So you're getting some reach, you're getting some attention and you're getting some backlinks, but also some pieces you can use on your site. So when you reach out to other media, you look more legit. When you don't have some press and you try to reach out and get other media, it's, it's a lot harder to get. Absolutely. So do you think business owners can do it themselves or do they need to hire a PR expert? Well, it, honestly, it depends on what point in your business journey you're in. You know, if you are somebody that's more of a startup, I would advise you to try and do it yourself. Just get out there because you're going to know how to tell your story better than anybody else at that point in time in your career and find things that are newsworthy about what you're doing. Because I think that's one of the things where people stumble is they don't know what's newsworthy about what they're doing. Um, you know, are you a woman owned business? Are you a veteran owned business? Is there a certain reason that you started your business that may be interesting to other people? Is there a charity you work with? Like things like that are newsworthy because they have an angle to them where they're interesting, but that should be something early on you're doing yourself. And then you're gonna find as you grow and you wanna get larger pieces and larger 
reach and things like that, that's when you start to work with a PR firm because they're going to do a lot of the legwork for you. They're going to get a lot of things out there for you. But early on, you know, you shouldn't be throwing money away at something that you can do yourself boots on the ground right away. Right. And I think also um, there are opportunities that might be missed in terms of like when you're out there and doing something good for the community, like you mentioned, okay, so you go to schools and you have um, an anti-drug education that you do, or mm-hmm. you sponsor, you know, a baseball game or the chili cook-off for the neighborhood or whatever it is that you are doing to help, you better publicize it because that's, yes. that's how it gets known. And that can be also newsworthy. Yeah. And, and I think I, I talked to a business owner about this once too, and he's like, well, I can see the value in what you do, but he's like, I'm just going to keep doing what I do, what I'm doing. And eventually people are going to notice me. And it's kind of like, oh, you're really leaving too much of a chance like that. Because especially with the news cycle being the way it is, you know, it used to be a 24 hour news cycle. Now it seems like it's like a four hour news cycle where things last that long. So you have to be out there telling other people your story and getting in front of people to do that. So you have to be publicizing what you're doing. And some people are like, oh, I don't want to flaunt my good works. It's like, you're not flaunting them. You're showing other people, this is what you stand for. And these are the things you do so that they can say, they can see if they agree or disagree with that, or they trust you more or trust you less because of that. So you need to get out there and tell other people about it. You can't just hope it's going to get found. Absolutely. So what we learned so far is that you have to make yourself known, right? I mean, you have to get out there on and make yourself known. So part of doing that is being interviewed on podcasts, right? So that's, that is a key ingredient, in my opinion. I mean, I love podcasts. I love being a guest on podcasts. I love doing my own pod. I love doing my own podcast. And I feel that that is really a very strong communication line that is being used now more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And I know you have your own podcast and you help people, business owners, entrepreneurs to actually get booked on podcasts. We actually have a mutual client that you booked her. I just read a success story that you sent the other day via your email, um, it's Adi, the co-founder of Timmy, and her name is Adi as well. Yeah, we both of us have the same name, but it's basically- And then we actually, we actually spe- spelled my, my daughter Adelaide's a nickname, A-D-I, because of Adi's name too. So there you go. <laughs> oh, I thought it was because of me, Jeremy. Okay. Oh, no, okay. It, was, it was because of you all along, all along. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. So- <laughs> So, you know, like one of the, what you, the success that she had is that she has, uh, she's the co-founder of Timmy Blends, which is a lifestyle tea and skincare company. And she wanted to get her message out and you helped her being booked on shows that were specific, the ones that she wanted. So mm-hmm. with different influencers in that particular area that she wanted to communicate on. And that led to incredible, it was so successful, right? So that is a great story on example of how you help book people on podcast. Mm-hmm. So from your perspective, why is it important for business owners, entrepreneurs, et cetera, to actually go and speak on podcasts? Well, because honestly, like, like what we're doing now, there's not many places you can have a long form conversation like this anymore. There really isn't. Like if you get on uh, a radio or a TV piece, there are a few minutes. Like it's, it's a very quick place you can actually create a lot more of an ability for people to know, like, and trust you. So you can really tell your story. You can really help people understand. But at the same time, people are coming to podcasts because they want education. And I think that's a really valid point for a lot of business owners, because if you become the educator, then you're going to show people why they need to work with you. And I think that's really, really, really important because people then, if they walk away with a ton of value, they're already walking away with that trust factor created. And that's why we always tell people you should be giving away something on an interview that helps people apply what you taught them because then they come off with even another win. And when they get a win outside of that, you're just your content, just by doing something, they're either going to come back to you or tell other people about you. We've gotten referrals from people that never actually had a sales call with us because they had wins from our content on a podcast and they tell other people about us. So that's the really valuable aspect to it. And at the same time, um, it also can service people in different levels of their journey, right? Like there's smaller podcasts and larger podcasts. And the other thing too, is the ability to niche is honestly insane. Like we had a client that her business was, she walked into people's homes when they got to a certain age and they, she would help them, you know, them or their parents reorganize the home so that they didn't, you know, injure themselves. She actually went into people's homes and, and reorganized it in that way. Very interesting business, very successful business, but it's kind of like, where do you talk about that? There are so many shows 
uh, for caring for elderly parents, for family shows, for things like that. So you can really get in front of just the sp specific type of audience you need to be in front of and, and really make a really big impact with them. So that ability is not available for you in any other place. And, and I, I feel like that's why it's so incredible. And then even from the search engine optimization benefits, every episode you're on, you're getting a backlink to your website too. And a, a lot of these website hosts have high authority scores. So you're, you're getting found with a link that really matters too. Absolutely. So let's say we have a business owner that is listening to us right now and he goes, yeah, you know, I, I should be on a podcast. Mm -hmm. So what should they do? How, how, where do you find a podcast? How do you start? How do you be a, how, how can you make yourself a guest on a podcast? Well, I want to go back to the first thing we talked about in the local media. Start mm -hmm. there, honestly. Start gathering some of those pieces and building a, a page on your site for all of your media. A lot of people don't do that part. And you're going to be a lot more successful if you build a media page on your website, store all the places you're featured and logos and things like that. That's really, that's step zero. You know what I mean? That's the mm -hmm. thing you need to have a, a, available for yourself. At the same time, making sure you have like a, a good professional bio. There's two different versions people are going to be looking for depending on the show. There's a 50 word bio or a 200 word bio and have some quality images. If you're saying, hey, like, you know, I can't afford that right now. And I, I, I know I need photos and I can't afford that right now. A lot of photography students in school have to take a certain amount of photos to graduate and will be more than happy to take your photo because it's a, it's a portfolio piece for them. So have those basic media pieces in place for yourself and then start worrying about approaching podcasts and things like that. Local media is just much easier to attain. Now, I tell people to start with a spreadsheet where you're going to actually create your dream shows. Like, oh my God, if I was on this show, it would change my business. This show would change my business. List those five or 10 of them out and don't start there. What you're going to do is you're going to use things um, like Apple Podcasts or Chartable.com and put in those shows that you're looking at, but then look for shows that are similar to those. And then when you're looking at those shows, you want to look for shows that have less than 50 reviews and less than 50 episodes, because that's going to be a very good place to start because um, number one, they're very hungry for content. Number two, they're probably as new at doing interviews as you are. So you're going to kind of get comfortable in a space where it matters. And if you mess up, it, it's not as big a deal. But that's kind of the first place you're going to start. If you're more advanced in your business, you know you can try and go for some home runs out of the gate. But a lot of people are going to start with smaller to medium-sized podcasts. And as you start to build that up, then you can start to approach bigger shows. Those early shows you're going to be approaching, most of the time, you're going to be reaching out to a host. But what you're going to be finding is as shows grow, they may have a producer. They may have um, somebody that runs all their content. So you're going to want to find out who that contact person is and how you communicate to them. It's going to be a little bit different than how you talk to a host. Now, I always tell people that this, despite the fact that it's old, email is still the most effective way to write a pitch. But I tell people the subject line is going to be vital because you get about nine words in a subject line, depending on the length of the word. So I always tell people that that subject line has really got to matter. And also look for Google's penalty words. Google has penalty words where if you use them, they're going to automatically spam your email. Oh, really? Where can you find that? That's really just go Just Google um, uh, penalty words in Google. Uh, just just look up look up penalty words in Google. There's a list of like all these words and it's like weight loss. It's like stuff like that is going to... they're you're not going to hit an inbox. So that's kind of the first thing you want to figure out is what words will Google not show my stuff to anybody because of? So that's, that's number one. Um, that subject line should be, like I said, like nine words would be a really great place to start. And it's something that really impacts people. Something that's going to break through what everybody else sends them. Do not send an email that says guest request or media requests or something like that. But that subject line is vital because that's your first barrier. If you can get through that and actually get somebody to read, that's really, really important. Now, when you're actually writing a pitch, the first 50 words are the most important because, and you want to break those off and make them bold from the rest of your pitch, because that is what people are going to see first. And if it's a long email, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, that's a long email. I don't want to do anything with that. So those first 50 words should have, and this is why Adi's pitch was so, uh, Adi Arazini's pitch was, was, worked so well. She has a lot of stats. So it's, she's somebody that you can really kind of pack that first paragraph with all the things she's done and achieved. So maybe you're in a different space in your business where you don't have a ton you've achieved yet. Figure out how you can talk about it in a way that it sounds impressive or that it sounds really cool. But those first 50 words are going to grab somebody's attention so you can then tell the rest of your story. It's always about 
what is my story? What do I have to teach that your audience can walk away with? It's not about what's in it for, for you as the person pitching. It's always about what's in it for the person you're helping. So that's really how you're going to approach it. And then follow-up is super, super important. You should be following up every three to five days uh, until you tell some, till somebody tells you to go away. Like that, That's really, really vital right. um, to seeing success with that. That's amazing, Jeremy. I mean, that's why you are so successful is because you just give that stuff away. You, you just told us your secrets, right? About how you actually book people on shows. I love that. I love that. That's amazing. It's amazing advice. And it's really like mm-hmm. anybody that is listening to us right now, they can theoretically go do it because now we know how, right? But that's mm-hmm. also where you come into play because I'm a, I'm a firm believer in terms of like stay in your genius zone, do what you do best and then mm-hmm. hire professionals, but true professionals to do the rest, right? Yes. So, I always like to give that vi- the example, you know, I know how to do bookkeeping really well, but I'm not going to do the bookkeeping for my business because it Oh, is- I did bookkeeping the first two years. I will never do that again. Oh my gosh. I'm good at it, but I hate it. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, you know, I actually love it. I don't mind doing it. And I actually even had my own bookkeeping business in the past. But mm-hmm. the problem is that it just, it takes away from me doing things f- to grow my business, which is yes. really what I want to do. Yes. So, Instead of spending time and figuring out how you can book yourself on podcasts, they should just come to you and utilize you and your team to book them on podcasts because that's what you do. And now mm-hmm. that we understand your process, we're like, this is genius. This is how you get people on really popular podcasts. Well, and here's um, another point to that too. I'm going to give you guys another golden nugget as well. Um, if you're on LinkedIn and you have a, um, what is it, a premium account? Is that what they call it? It's premium? Yeah. I think okay, so. Okay, so yeah, so whatever the one where you get the little gold badges, I, I have that, whatever it is. The one that you pay for. The one you pay for, yeah, you pay like 50 something bucks a month. Um, if you have that type of account, um, you can also send uh, what are called the in messages. In-mail, or the, the in-mail, yeah, yeah, the in mail to messages to people you aren't connected with. That's another really successful way to get yourself booked as well um, because you have more of a chance of them seeing it. Because, like I said, you don't have to worry as much about spam like you do on, on Google. Google is rough. Like we're always having to change what we're doing on the back end because we're like, all right, we found something that works really well. And then Google's like, all right, so we're going to penalize you. So then we find something else that works really well. So then Google penalizes us again. So you always want to find out how you can work around some of those things. But if you can send in mail to people, you'll have a lot of success that way too. So when you book people on shows, you actually do that for them, right? I mean, you yes. create, you just basically, I mean, we're, we're white glove. Them? We take them through a coaching process to really like, teach them how to be a great guest because we look at every interview having three parts, your story, your message, and your call to action. So we walk people through that and we do it backwards too because you always want to start where you're going to finish. And uh, we walk them through that coaching that coaching process. We book them on shows and then we also make sure they're prepped for every show when they go on it as well. An additional thing we do is we give all of our clients a, uh, a marketing course to teach them like what to do with all the content you're creating because people don't realize like there's you can create years of content of one podcast interview. So, so that's essentially what we do for people. Great. Okay. So you book on the, po- on the podcast. So give us a little bit about what, what makes a great interview. So you said yeah. it's your message, it's your call of action, it's your, sto- it's your story, your message. Your story, call message, call to action. And we always tell people when you're going to put it together, you start backwards. So like, what do you want people to do at the end of an interview? And that's going to affect all the other, all the other things you do, right? Like, let's say that you have a giveaway that's going to be your top five things that somebody has to do to be a LinkedIn superstar. And okay, so if that's the case, then you're not going to tell your whole life story because it doesn't make sense with being a LinkedIn superstar and it doesn't make sense with your teaching points around that. So then you would backtrack that and, and, and you would look at your message. What are the key things you can set, you can teach? Usually like three is a good number because you're not going to have an ability to talk about much more than that in, in a podcast interview. But what is something you can teach where you tell tell everything. Like we had a we had a client one time that gave away so much on podcast interviews. He had the podcast host hiring him. He was in the real estate investing space. So you really want to pretty much give away the store. And 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 you will find that it creates so much trust that people actually want to take advantage of your call to action. So you really want to teach. And then your your story is your story of transformation. You know, you started here, you learned X, Y, and Z, and now you're here. So it actually gives you permission to then teach your message and the call to action you want to do at the end. But the reason the call to action is so important, and, and we always people are always like, oh, I want to give away an ebook, and that's like the worst thing you can give away. The reason being, right? When you look at education, there's always two parts to education. There's the theory of it and the doingness of it. So when you are getting the information, 
you get more information, what are you going to do with that? So, like, you want to give away a worksheet. You want to give away something people can do something with. Even so an introductory to, course, right? You can right, have even an introductory course, something that has doing in it, even if it's small. Just don't give them more education after you just gave them education. So, because then it really gives them a better understanding of what you taught them. So, when they walk away with something, they're going to be like, wow, Adia is awesome. Like, not only is she a great interviewer, but like, she really knows her stuff about building processes. I'm, I'm going to get her help or, you know, what? I'm going to tell my friend John to get her help. So that's what you really need to be thinking about when you're being a great guest on a podcast. That's amazing. So we, you actually gave me the process right now on how to book myself or somebody on a, on a podcast, right? Because yes. we have all the actions that you told us that you have to do, including the follow up. So that's the process. And mm-hmm. then you just tell us how to do a great interview. I mean, all the yeah. aspects that have to be there. You have to have the story, the message, the call to action. And, you know, and I can see why, I mean, I listened to your podcast, you interviewed me, you are an amazing interviewer because you're always very interested, you're welcome, you're always very interested, you ask really good questions, you know, you don't script it ahead of time, you just move. I do a little bit though, because because it is important, it is important, like, that's one weird thing that I do is I listen to a lot of interviews that somebody's been on before because I want to understand how they communicate. Like, there's usually two types of guests, there's somebody that won't shut up, and then there's somebody that won't say anything. So like I have to understand like how they communicate going into it. So at least I know how to ask questions. I'll have a couple setup questions ready for myself, but a lot of it is like what comes up in conversation. Yeah. So from your experience, what do you think people, listeners, now let's talk, we talk about the interviewee, the interviewer. Yeah. So what do you think listeners really like in a podcast? What will make a listener listen to a podcast? Something that they're not hearing on every single other podcast, right? Because it can kind of feel rote after a while where you're kind of hearing the same thing over and over again. So kind of making sure that when you're, when you're on a show that you're adding value, that's unique to that show, right? That, that, that is unique to that subject line, like not just going on there and giving the same spiel to give everywhere. So something that's unique to that specific type of podcast, because maybe they're in a certain type of industry and that's why they're on that show. So you want to make sure it's relevant to why people are coming to that podcast. I think that's really important. But at the same time, that it's valuable to them. Like, what are they going to walk away with at the end? Like, I, I, I don't think people go to a podcast because they're like, oh my gosh, that is the most interesting person out there. Like, I think they do a little bit. Like, they want to be interested. But at the same time, they want to walk away with something where they can actually use that in their life. And sometimes it is motivation, but a lot of times it's what can someone walk away with? And I think that's really, really vital is how much value are you going to bring to the person listening to you? I agree because I think people will listen to celebrities. Like if, you know, if if it's a celebrity, a well-known personality on the podcast, they will listen because of the personality involved. But the majority of the time is because they want to learn. I mean, that's why I listen to podcasts. You know, I will listen to podcasts. Well, now I drive less, you know, with with all the working from home and everything. But when I was driving a lot or traveling a lot, you know, mm-hmm. I would listen to podcasts because I use that time to learn. I still do when I take a walk or when I exercise, I would listen to podcasts. And I like to listen to people in my industry, other people to see what they're doing, what ideas do they have. I listen to podcasts really to get ideas, to get uh, to hear something that is innovative, things to mm-hmm. say top of, you know, basically on top of what's new, what's out yeah. there, what other people find successful. And I think you can really learn it from those conversations. So yes, I think it's I, I listen because number one, I'm a huge nerd. So like, I just love, like, I, I listen to like history podcasts. So like I have this one hardcore history, the episodes are like six hours, but I love them and they're great. Um, so like, there's one part of that. The other part is I get my news from podcasts because I just find that most of what I'm looking for just isn't out there. So I get news from podcasts. The other thing is like, if I want to learn something, if I'm, if I'm looking for a skill, if I'm looking for knowledge on something, I'll go out and find a podcast. But I feel like it fills because it's audio um, and you can take it with you anywhere. I feel like it's so accessible. Absolutely. It's, that's for sure. It is the, the best method right now of, it's, you know, instead of listening to the radio, you listen to the podcast. So I agree yeah. with you 100%. So what are some of the no's, like something that you shouldn't do as a guest on a podcast that you coach your clients or even from mm-hmm. your experience when listening to a podcast, you're like, oh no, I can't believe that either the interviewers <laughs> did it or the interview is like, what are the no? <laughs> know the name of the host. <laughs> That's the number one. <laughs> like you can have somebody show up and like, so, so 
my name's Jeremy Slate, but I go by Jeremy Ryan Slate on the written word because my parents named me after an actor. So somebody would show them and be like, hey, Ryan, how's it going? I'd be like, oh, that's kind of weird. Um, like definitely know the host name. Like it's really important. And I, I, if you can go find a YouTube video or another interview where they say their name with the correct pronunciation so that you say it. Um, like it's just, it's important to kind of grant somebody that. That's just number one. Number two is like, you don't have to have like, you know, I have a, a really high end mic here. You don't have to have this, but have something, whether it's earbuds, whether it's your snowball mic, whatever it may be, have something because good audio is important. And one of the number one reasons people stop listening to a podcast is because it's hard to listen to. So that, that's, you know, really handle that barrier for yourself. Um, the other thing I would say is just making sure that you're showing up in a way of, um, you talked before about interest, interested versus interesting. Yeah. Show up in a way that you're not showing up just to be interesting. Show up in a way where you're interested in how people are receiving your information, you're, how you're interested in them. And that's really going to have a big effect on what people get out of it. So to me, th those are the big no's. Um, you know, have some sort of mic. Um, I've found surprisingly ear pods are bad for interviews. I don't know why it's something about them. They're not great for podcast interviews, but have some sort of mic, um, know the host name and, um, you know, make sure you're showing up in a way where you're going to really, really add value. And it's not just like, Hey, look at me. I'm, I'm interesting. I agree. And I think, you know, in terms of also be interested in the host, like what yes. the host is asking, because it has to be a conversation because I've seen where um, you would have a guest where they were like super thinking about what they're going to say next or how they're coming across or really want to also sell their company or their product or whatever, like promote it. This is not the uh, purpose of the majority of the podcast. That's a I really good point too, because like, you don't want to be like the, you know, like, do you remember Billy Mays? Mm -mm. He used to sell the, I think like the sham wow. He'd like all these commercials would be like Billy Mays here. And he'd be showing something, telling something on TV. There's people that go on podcasts where they're always like pitching something. You know what yeah. I mean? And it's like, it's not really like, don't be the as seen on TV guy. When you show up, teach. I, I yeah. it's a pet peeve of mine when somebody's like, you ask them a question. You're like, well, I have a YouTube video about that. Or on page blah, blah, blah of my book, I talk about that. Or I have a product that does that. People are there to learn from you. When you do stuff like that, you're taking away from your own credibility because you're saying, oh, it's gated. You can't have it unless right. you're willing to pay for it. And people are actually there to learn from you. They're not there to just find out how interesting you are. So that, that's a really, really great point. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, you know, in terms of the books, you know, if somebody asks you a question, and it's really in your book and you only have like a minute to answer, answer the question first of all, as yes. you said. But then yes. you can say, you know, this is, this is the short version because we have a minute. I mm -hmm. would like to elaborate more. And you can also just, you, you know, let you know, it's also, it's available in my book that you can get on Amazon or whatever. So you, they know it's a resource, but I agree. It's not like, okay, go to my book. I'm not going to answer. You have to answer the question. I had one interview that I didn't publish like that because every time I asked the guest something, they shot. They, they try to shoot the audience somewhere, and it's like, what's the point in this interview? Like, like who does this have value to? You, and that's it. Exactly. So that's like that's part of it in terms of like don't sell, be interested, have the conversation with the host because the, that's what shows is how you are having a conversation with another person, mm -hmm. which is super super um, important because that's really and what people educate. Also look at. educate. Educate because Absolutely. if you if you can become the information source your credibility is like up here. And I think Absolutely. that's the thing you really need to look at because the best in every industry, what do they do? They get so successful, they educate. So when you're doing that in somebody's mind, they're already thinking like, wow, this person knows what they're doing. Exactly. That's exactly right. It's like when you're out there, when you're doing a podcast, you want to make sure, think about it. The way that I think about it is that there will be a percent of people that will do it themselves. Like when you told us how to do different things. Oh, yeah. They will do it themselves and go and do it. And let's empower them to do that. I love that. Sure. There will be always those that will not do anything. And there will be those that will seek help, but whether with you or somebody else, but they will at least now know what a podcast is, but they go, oh yeah, Jeremy Slate. Yes. He's the expert on But that, that's, that's true too. Cause I've had that in my experience where like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the 3% that'll do it myself, uh, sometimes to a detriment. But, um, you know, when I started my podcast, there was a few people particularly I learned from and I tell everybody about them. So, you know, if you have success with somebody, whether you did it yourself or whether you did it with them, 
that level of trust is incredible because people will become evangelists for you. And that's very cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. And follow you. And, you know, I love listening to um, subscribing to YouTube channels where I learn something when somebody gives the information about how to use a software tool or some or technology tool that they really want to learn. And, and then I become more and more familiar with them. And then I go, yeah, I should hire them as a consultant because I got to a point where I cannot do it myself anymore <laughs> or I don't want to. So they're just building your credibility. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So Jeremy, when you listen to a podcast, do you listen into a regular speed, double speed, triple speed? How do you listen? What's the speed that you like to listen to? So once again, I'm weird. I can't, I can't do the double speed or the, or, or whatever. And I definitely can't do half speed. I don't know how somebody can do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. So I, I'm always doing things at, at regular speed. Number one, because like, if it's history, it's a concept I really need to get. And it may take me really listening to it and pausing it, make sure I'm not going past words I don't get and things like that. Or um, if if it's when I'm doing preparation for an interview, which is a lot of times when I'm listening, I, I, I'm listening for, for vocal tonations and stuff like that. So if I'm listening at double speed, I'm just not going to pick that up. So I think part of it is the reason you're listening. Very true. Yeah. When you listen to somebody's interview, when you're interviewing, about to interview them, you also have to look at their speed. You have to listen to their speed so you know how to adjust to it. Yep. Yep. Well, this interview, nobody can listen on double speed because you and I are like talking like at four speed. Well, uh, I'm from New Jersey, so we just do everything fast here. You know, it's it's I, I it's when I was a kid, they'd always make me like slow down when answering the phone. Cause be, they, it's yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so, Jeremy, tell me in we're almost at the end of the interview, but I want to know if our listeners, so whomever is listening to us right now, how mm -hmm. would they know if they're a good client or a good prospect that they should pick up the phone or email you or text you or reach out to you. So what, what are the characteristics of your best clients? So usually they're people that are already super successful in their space and they want to get to that next level. So we're really helping them get out in a bigger way than they already have been out. And that's really what our best clients look like. They're people that have a really, really good purpose because we say we only work with people that are visionary founders, somebody that has a big vision that they want to make real. Um, so if you've had some success, you have a big vision and, um, you know, you really want to get, get out there in a bigger way. That's who we want to work with. We want to work with those types of people, um, because that's where we've had the most success, honestly. Absolutely. I'm with you on that. And I was going to ask you what differentiates you from others, but I don't think there is a need to, because people that listen to you, that we can understand right away that you are completely <laughs> unique and have your, what's, you know, if, if people listen to you and they don't, have, they're not close on working with you, they're not really not your clients. So exactly. No, that's, that's, but that's another praise and podcasts are great, right? Because people really get to know you. And I think that's vital. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jeremy, thank you so much for being a guest. You are amazing. I'm so happy we got to do this interview. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. This has been awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for listening to the System Simplified podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.